Now I don't want to sound like the guy screaming it was better back in my day, but when a new game comes out and its selling points tout a hundred hour runtime with near limitless exploration and procedural generation, I can't help myself but to feel a little overwhelmed. Now don't get me wrong, I would love nothing more than to go out there and explore the universe, but as it stands, I also have to make time to explore Hyrule, the lands between and wherever The Witcher takes place. But even then, whenever I have time, I find myself here, just scrolling away through YouTube shorts. Many times it's nothing, little more than just audiovisual noise, the most boiled down to the very essentials content, just to keep you swiping. But every once in a while you get something. Maybe not a breathtaking revelation or a well-produced masterpiece, but something that gives you pause, catches you off guard, and ends the cycle. For me, it was this guy. Just some dude in Red Dead Redemption 2 chopping a tree down. But that tree fell. And that tree bounced. Now, I never fully understood the Red Dead franchise. I remember seeing the first one when it came out and thought it looked cool as hell. I played probably a hundred hours of Redemption 1, most of which was spent in the frozen north locked in a shed as mountain lions ferociously attacked us. And when Redemption 2 came out on PC, I played through that as well. I thought it was a well-written story with some memorable characters, but in order to keep up with the new releases, I semi-stressed through it ended up with around 60 hours on the clock just to see the mainline story through. I remember it was well written, bombastic and grandiose, but this? I don't remember this. I don't remember the details of it. And so I thought, I've got a couple of days, a few hundred newly freed up gigabytes, why not go back? Pack my bags, polish up the six shooters, and saddle up the horse again. I don't really have a horse in here. Well, I got this. I got this. We'll make do. We'll make do. Red Dead Redemption 2 is, at the time of writing, Rockstar Games' most recent new release, and for many, arguably, their biggest triumph. Lauded for its genre-topping characters, drama, and freedom, it's no secret that the game is often regarded as one of the greatest entries to ever grace its medium. But like so many other stories, it didn't begin this way. Like so many other stories, it began out in the Old West of the 1980s, where an unlikely partnership between one of the biggest Japanese game studios and an eccentric tequila-loving businessman was formed. I remember reading about a game called Red Dead Revolver in a local games magazine, and it was the first time where a title alone had managed to capture my interest. The Old West had always been intriguing to me. The tales of cowboys, outlaws, and the new frontier spoke to me like few others. But without seeing any screenshots or even a cover, the words Red Dead Revolver alone was just cool as hell. But like so many other stories, at one point, it might have gone by an even better name. It's impossible to discuss the origins of Red Dead without mentioning its godfather, Diego Angel. Growing up in Colombia, South America, his deep interest in film took him to the United States, where he developed a keen eye for computer-assisted animation, and roughly a decade on, in sunny Carlsbad, California, he founded Angel Studios, an animation studio that after a struggling start found its footing producing scenes for major corporations and publishers, and after a few stumbling years became a bona fide game developer of its own, leading to 1997, where Japanese megacorp Capcom entrusted Diego and his studio to port the wildly successful Resident Evil 2 to the even more successful Nintendo 64. If you read about Diego and his studio, it very quickly becomes clear that he was a one-of-a-kind man operating a one-of-a-kind office culture. In an article from 2018 by Blake Hester that you should absolutely read, previous employees recall Diego gathering the teams on Friday afternoon to wind down and partake in some tequila. Or as he would have put it, 
a little sippy whippy, which is um, well, the fact that they haven't put that on the bottle. That's a missed opportunity, man. The successful partnership between Angel Studios and Capcom on Leon's junior year adventure led to the latter approaching Diego again, but this time with a brand new intellectual property in mind. The new project was to go under the acronym SWAT, a term commonly associated with police teams and tactical combat, but after consideration in what could be thought of as a spiritual successor to Capcom's 1985 arcade hit Gunsmoke, a Western theme was established, backronyming the title to Spaghetti Western Action Team. In early 2002, Capcom announced the game's existence to the world, but behind the scenes, the development process was reportedly flanked by problems. The once blossoming partnership started to fall apart, and by the end of the year, Angel Studios found themselves under new management. The new industry rock stars behind the immensely popular carjack simulator Grand Theft Auto bought out the studio, renamed it Rockstar San Diego, and went sifting through the team's ongoing projects to see what would be salvageable, creative director Dan Hauser stumbled over a certain western-themed title. The game was reportedly unplayable at the time, possibly stemming from the development issues, but Hauser saw the potential. Capcom cancelled the project a year later, but Rockstar remained steadfast, acquired the license and went to work. The realm of open world games was on the cusp of changing forever with Red Dead Revolver. Red Dead Revolver, released in 2004 in North America and Europe and the following year with publishing help from Capcom in Japan. The game follows young outlaw Red as he's left a lone survivor of a bandit raid on his family home, with him dedicating his life to bring in justice to those who had wronged him. It's a simple premise, set in a simple world with simple mechanics. All right there, bounty hunter. That's enough disturbing the peace for one day. Hand over the weapon. I said, hand it over. The game taps into the very essentials of what playing a Wild West outlaw was about in your childhood days. Six shooters and lever action rifles dot the arsenal, and corrupt sheriffs and rival gangs fill out the bestiary. All set in locales ripped straight from the dime novels your grand 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 grandparents spent their hard earned silver dollars on. It is unforgivingly and unequivocally the Wild West. But a large part of the groundwork, keeping it all together, doesn't stem from the age of horseback shootouts and train robberies. No, the foundations were laid on a rainy night in a second-hand sedan more than a hundred years later. That rock star influence is shining almost as bright as the Western one. The team clearly drew inspirations from all of their previous projects, including the severely underrated Smuggler's Run franchise, but above them all is the game's position within the GTA release cycle. Rockstar had become industry royalty over the last few years, with GTA 3 and Vice City being almost universally loved. Two masterpieces that managed to define the early sixth console generation and were leaps and bounds ahead of the competition in terms of open world design, letting the player do pretty much whatever they wanted at pretty much any point. But while the worlds offered unseen freedom, the game's combat mechanics were considerably more restrictive. Both GTA 3 and Vice City originally lacked any form of manual aim control while moving either Claude or Tommy, and instead relied on a finicky, often frustrating auto-aim system. The games were revolutions on so many different levels, and as full 3D character control was still just leaving its infancy, the systems proved serviceable enough for the team to rock it up to the stars. As the years went on, however, and as more and more titles figured out intuitive ways of handling third-person combat, the early GTA 
entry's limitations became harder to ignore. From this angle, it's easy to speculate where Red Dead Revolver fits in, a smaller title than the enormous GTA opuses, and alongside the projects of Manhunt and Max Payne 2, it offered an arena to test new ideas and direction. Because the combat in Red Dead Revolver is, at first glance, very similar to Rockstar's previous releases, using similar iconography and controls, but it handles considerably more modern. Using the right analog stick for camera aiming wasn't always the obvious solution, but when implemented, it was hard to see any other way to design a user-friendly control scheme. And when the blockbuster San Andreas released later the same year, featuring a very similar combat design to Revolver, the pieces start to fall together. With their first foray into the Old West, Rockstar had their priorities. They wanted to tap into the nostalgia of playing Outlaws in the backyard while focusing on giving the players more control, letting the pre-turn of the century armament feel more like an extension of their bodies than previous big irons. The game, through its development struggles, ended up being a fairly short, linear shooter, with review scores all over the spectrum. Some publications lauded the visual style, while others thought it was too whimsical for its own good. For a lot of people, it became lumped together with the rest of Rockstar's smaller titles, which, while almost always great, wasn't able to even remotely touch the industry giants of the GTA franchise. But for the creators, Red Dead was different. The first step is always going to be the hardest, and the legacy of Red Dead wasn't to end with Revolver. The idea might have been born out of someone else's childhood dream, the first leg lined with thorns, and the final product might have missed the mark. But after all the struggles, just like on day one, the team still saw the potential. There was something here, a skeleton of ideas ready to be modified, altered beyond recognition, and then reassembled into something greater. Something achieving the prospects, something unlike any other, and something to love. There was something here to make your own. Just like for the world around them, the years ticked on at Rockstar. After the media-altering Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, the spider's web of studios spread all over the UK and North America managed to put out hit after hit. Ranging from brutal murder simulators, detailed street racers, and of all things, strangely faithful table tennis recreations, the Rockstar brand became synonymous with quality, even outside of their flagship GTA. And at the dawn of the new generation, our little San Diego-based outfit realized that now, with the increased power of the new consoles, the time had come to reach the potential that had always laid out in the Old West. In 2008, the flagship studio Rockstar North, located in Scotland, had just put out the first next-generation GTA title, GTA 4. And it was, just as you would expect it, a revolutionary leap for the series. It featured a return to the Liberty City from GTA 3, but this time it was so detailed, so simulated, and so full of life that upon its release, any competitor was instantly reminded why the term GTA knockoff was still used widely around the industry. The game was dense. Fake New York City was filled with characters, vehicles, buildings you can enter, and activities to extend the playtime virtually to infinity. I remember waking up in the morning, walking out of Roman's apartment, grabbing a hot dog on the way, hopping in the car to drive to the local internet cafe, only to spend the rest of the day browsing the fake internet. The game was insane when it came out, and it still stands today as one of the most living, breathing cities ever portrayed in the media. All of that is good, great even, but let's be real. The 360 and PS3 might have enabled Rockstar to bump up the detail, but filling the worlds with activities and details was never where they were lacking. GTA 4 is a masterpiece still to this day, but in many ways it was just the next logical step for that series. So what happens when the world they seek to recreate was kind of empty? Miles and miles of open, uninterrupted wilderness. Stretches of land without a soul to see, and acres of hills and valleys where you had to be content with the howling winds to be your company alone. 
In 2010, that is what Rockstar San Diego delivered. Set in 1911, Red Dead Redemption is the tale of a world long before the modern conveniences of Liberty City. But Redemption is also the tale of a world in flux. A world being dragged kicking and screaming into the 20th century. The age of outlaws and bandits were coming to an end in order to make room for civilization. For society. And right in the middle of this battle is you. Gunslinger turned family man being pushed back into the old world to hunt down the gang you used to ride for. John Marston. The way Rockstar decided to write John Marston and his story is considerably different from any of the previous ventures the studios had taken on, and can in many ways be seen as an oddly paced, weird way to present a story. But in my opinion, it's one of the keys that makes it work so well in the grander scheme. Something happened. Right before the game puts you in John's boots, the game alludes to something falling apart. It doesn't really tell you what. The gang you used to run with had broken up. Be it by infighting, conspiracy, or blackmail, the game doesn't ever really tell you. And this is how it continues for the rest of the runtime. The federal government uses you to track down three people you used to run with. Bill Williamson, Javier Escuela, and Dutch Vanderlind. Three names that to John apparently once meant the world, but to you, the player who just got dropped in here, they don't mean a hell of a lot. They're just targets, and for the longest time through the game, completely faceless ones at that. Three names on a paper that needs to die for you to live happily ever after. For the good of the world. For society. The frontier featured in Redemption, whether it's the American states of New Austin or West Elizabeth, or the Mexican province of Nuevo Paraiso, all have one thing in common. They do not want you there. Every element the game conveys to you screams that in your face. Mexico is undergoing a revolutionary war. The American South sees the last outlaws desperately clinging on to whatever they can. And further north, civilization has already taken a foothold and is creeping further and further into the desert every day. All Marston wants is to finish up this task so he can have his family return to him and live out his days quietly on his ranch. Every mission, every cutscene, every voice line delivery is steeped in this desperation to get it all over with and put it all behind him to move on. I did what you asked. I got you Williamson and Escuela. It's over. Stop playing games with me. The world is vast empty and stretches all the way to the horizon but it does so still featuring loads of activities anything from hunting hundreds of wild animals beating drunks in games of horseshoes or orchestrating your own train robberies but all of these stand almost directly against the direction of the main narrative of the game because the world doesn't want you in it the feds are only using you to get to their goals your old gang is splintered all across the country and the world as a whole is ready to move on. You're a product of a bygone era, and no matter how hard you try and move on with it, you can't. You're stuck here, completely disconnected, in a world that despises you. Because the world is changing. Red Dead Redemption was a massive triumph when it released. For many, it managed to be the first game to fully recreate their childhood dreams of playing Outlaw, and the lovingly crafted world invited millions to follow John Marston's journey. The complicated revenge story it told placed the player in the middle of a complex, deep conflict between parties not ever fully explained, and asked you to do the bidding of the new world against your old. It was a game fully designed to sink hours and hours into, but at every narrative turn, it hunted you down, reminding you that this world wants you out. Is that so? In a way. What's your name? You know, it's the darndest thing I can't remember. Tell me your damn name and where you know me from. Well, I know you're from Mexico, I know you're from back out west, I know you from all over. Tell me your name or I won't be responsible for my actions. Oh, but you will. You will be responsible. This is a fine spot. 
See you around, cowboy. But you want to explore. Your very instincts beckon for you to just step out into the wild, pick a direction, and go. But everything else is screaming at you to hurry, get it on over with and move on. Civilization is waiting around the corner and so are a million other games. Are you really going to spend 300 hours here and miss out on everything new that's coming out? Are you really going to fall behind the curve and miss out on being part of the conversation for the next big thing? Because the world is changing. $60 grew to 70, 80, 100 and you need to work more hours just to even begin considering the luxury of virtual exploration in the first place. But I want to explore new things, new places and new worlds. Maybe 30 hours here is enough. Maybe I've gotten my money's worth. I can't justify spending the two hours I have each day plucking away at a thousand hour save file. I gotta move on, buy something new, play something current and see something different. I have to be part of the conversation. I need the sense of community. Because the world is changing. If I stay still for too long in one spot, maybe it'll leave me behind. That's how I played Red Dead Redemption 2 when it came out in 2019. It was hyped up as one of the best games of all time the first time it released a year before on consoles. So when it came out on PC, I had to play it. I needed to be part of that community, be it only for a few weeks or days, and keep up with the conversation. But November of 2019 wasn't just Redemption 2 territory. A few days later, Jedi Fallen Order was coming out, the brand new Pokemon, and the still mystifying Shenmue 3. And I needed to play those too, lest I'd be forgotten about and fallen behind the curve. So Red Dead 2 needed to be rushed. I played through the main story side frustratingly whenever a new side activity popped up that I felt compelled enough to do and ended up with around 60 or so hours on the clock as I saw the credits roll. I liked it. It made me emotional and was strikingly beautiful all throughout, but it needed to be sidelined for me to be able to keep up to speed. Because the world wanted me out of there and on to greener pastures. Or at least I thought so. Because despite me playing the majority of the new releases and rarely dropping out of the current online zeitgeist, the world of Red Dead Redemption 2 always managed to stick around. In the back of my mind, some remnant of the experience that I for a couple of hours had blazed through and put aside was always back there. Brewing. And for the first time in the franchise's history, Red Dead reached out. The world wanted me to come back. Red Dead Redemption 2 is the cash-in on Rockstar's long game, being one of the last hurrahs for the PS4s and Xbox Ones before those, just like any generation before them, would be put aside for more power. The sibling series of GTA only received an update to bring the fifth entry to the current generation, but Redemption 2 was, visually, everything you could have expected and more. Eight years on from John Marston's entry onto the scene, Rockstar set out to finish the tale they started telling a whole generation ago. You don't look so good. I don't feel too good neither. I'm freezing. Don't die just yet, cowboy. The story in Redemption 1 was told aggressively, harshly and at points with such rapid pace that you wonder if horseback travel really should ever have gone out of style. The game plops you into its world, stuffs you into John's boots and forces you to keep up. Main characters are whispered about quietly, given little to no exposition before their demise comes, only for the player to even after the journey is done, be left questioning how much these men you just killed really mattered. It's a Wild West way of telling a revenge story, but it incentivizes John's ironclad will to leave all of this behind. These men you were sent out to take the life of clearly once meant the world to him, probably more than any of us could ever understand without going through it with him. But now a civilization stands there knocking on the door and all he wants is to return to his family 
They mean nothing. It's not John's revenge. He's simply out there to serve it. And come Red Dead 2, the rest of the pieces start to fall together. I don't feel like being laughed at by the likes of you two. Stop it! Now! You fools punching each other when Como Driscoll's needing punching hard. You want to sit around waiting for him to come find us? All of you, we got work to do. Redemption 2 being a prequel allows the player to get intimately familiar with the gang John 12 years later swears he's forgotten. Faces, character archetypes and personalities only briefly glimpsed in 2010 are given the center stage, treating you as one of them, come hell or high water. It's only now, a whole generation later, that Bill, Javier, Abigail and maybe more importantly Dutch are fully introduced, developed and understood. Nearly a decade lived without fully comprehending the actions taken in 1911, without grasping the nuance of the decision to pull the trigger at the dawn of the new century. Eight years later, Rockstar cashes in on their long game. What had always felt like a cold, angry, hateful world was remodeled and redefined. While the gang is on the run and you can feel the long arm of the law creeping in from all sides, the sense of community is always present. No matter how far away you may find yourself, you know that your family is never further than a trail away. And all of this is presented to you, the player, through no better way than a single character. A single character that's completely absent from Redemption 1. Maybe because they weren't important. Or maybe for some other reason. Oh, wie wunderbar. Oh. Sie sind ein großer Mann. Ja. Ein großer Mann. Ja, wirklich. Es ist ein Segen, dass wir sie getroffen haben. Come on, get out of here. This place ain't safe. Get out of here! Ja, ja, Vamos. alles klar. Vamos. Uh, ich hab was für Sie. Einen Moment. Uh, um, Dankeschön. Thank you. Vielen Dank, herzlichen Dank. Guess it was a pleasure. Arthur Morgan. The character you play through Redemption 2 as is one of gang leader Dutch's oldest right hand men and an integral part of it. I think we can hit it. I ain't never robbed in a city before. Yeah, well, you leave the planning to me. You'll ride with me. Always. Arthur is loyal, cares for little else than the well-being of the gang, and while you have the option to play him more or less honorably, his ever-present steadfastness transcends any game mechanic. The gang is on the run. The law is actively hunting them down, and after blowing the last job, money is running low. Throughout the game, the eyes are always set on the horizon where living in peace away from the chaos is said to be a possibility. Dutch makes promises, everyone else listens, and you keep working. Arthur is the connection you have to the world. Everything you see is through his eyes. And while he pretends to be a stubborn, angry man at most times, surprisingly this time, the world doesn't. But you'll always be my friend. Well, of course I'm your friend, but you ain't always fair with me. If I was fair with you and a good person, I'd have had you hanged a long time ago. Well, that's true. <laughs> in the 1899 that Redemption 2 plays out in, the federal government is already hunting down the remaining outlaws from America's frontier. But there's no single file revenge plot taking place. There's no constant force to hurry or complete missions as soon as possible. The America here is still dangerous, hateful, and a lot of people would rather see you dead than alive, but overshadowing them all is breathing room. Going back into Red Dead Redemption 2, after reacquaintancing myself with the series, I made it a point to take my time. Fully disregard the outside world, any online discourse, and just exist within Rockstar's 19th century America. For as long as it took. Obviously trying to do every story mission and stop at the predefined stranger encounters out in the wild, but also to just exist. Open my eyes and fully experience the world that had been put before me. No matter how small.
I just walked for miles and miles with nothing ahead of me and nothing behind. At times where I gotten stranded somewhere away from my horse previously, I would have bolted, furiously tapped the X button to quickly get back and continue the story, but this time? No. It didn't feel like something Arthur would do. It didn't feel right. He was dressed in three layers, had just woken up from a drunken stupor, and it was a nice, breezy, sunny morning. So why not just walk? I understand if it might seem strange. Why would I decide to play a video game and then forcefully choose to not really engage with the main mechanics of the game for hours at a time, just holding the analog stick forward and watching as your character slowly strolls across the countryside can't really be engaging, can it? For everyone, I'm sure it isn't. And before I ended up here, I would probably have fallen into the same camp, but slowing down, connecting with what the character would do, and just letting the world play out around him for a while allowed for a completely different experience than I'd ever had. Because the world that Rockstar built for Red Dead Redemption 2 is arguably one of the most detailed ones to ever grace the medium. While the urban sprawl of the GTA series had always packed millions of items and objects in close alleyways and city streets, here, the wide open fields and canyons all sport micro-level detail to the extent that once you start looking close, it gets obscene. Boots and hooves leave prints in the newly wet mud, fallen snow gets pushed away underfoot, and if you ever take a tumble, get ready to find a river or pay for a bath, lest everyone make fun of you Hello. for your hygiene. I don't even want to know why there's blood and gore all over you. Details found in every aspect, no matter town or meadow, and playing the game at the blistering speed I did the first time around, I was awestruck with the sheer quality of the experience, but slowing down, allowing for the game to breathe and taking a closer look at every dirt road, every blade of grass and every roaming wild animal, having the game not only hold up its detailed presentation, but expand it and reward me for doing so, left me enthralled. Easy, whoa. Last time I'd played the game, the main frustration I had with the design was the mission structure. It was a conundrum to me at the time that while Rockstar had built this huge, near limitless open world, almost all of the missions boiled down to go exactly here, do exactly this, shoot these guys, and then go exactly here. There was almost never any opportunity to experiment or enjoy the freedom of the open world, but I think now that I might have been playing it wrong. All of these design decisions are still in the game and very few of the main missions play out differently, but when, instead of treating the main missions as the cornerstone of the experience, I spent tens of hours just existing in the extreme freedom of the wild between the roller coaster shootouts of the story romps, it became a whole nother game. The sudden linearity now didn't take away from the experience, it focused it enough for a couple of minutes, turned off all outside influence and reminded me that no matter what happens, the gang comes first. And when the score is settled, the bounty is delivered or whatever else Dutch had thought up, the world opened up again and I could return home. Get the, hell out of here. the world had seen what I was doing. It saw me showing genuine interest, going out of my way to explore what it was offering and allowing for it to show me every little thing it wanted me to see. The world wanted me there. <laughs> Give me a minute. Give me a minute. I'll be fine in a minute. Uh, you had in there, friend. Go on. Can I help you? Uh, I, I need a doctor. It was all going so well. There were setbacks, of course, but Dutch said money was getting saved up, there was a plan, and everything was heading in the right direction. But then it fell apart. You, Charles, you take folks up that way. Micah. And I need to do some reconnaissance. I ain't got a final plan yet. 
Arthur, I ain't got it. I just need time. I need time and no traitors. At the end of the later chapters in the game, as things start going wrong, Dutch grows impatient and paranoid, and the divide between him and Arthur grows deeper. Mistrust, conspiracy and fear run like wildfire within the gang, and as chapter 5 rolls around and Arthur starts feeling weaker and weaker, a doctor in bustling Saint-Denis gives Three. the final word. Again? Let me see your tongue. And say ah. Ah. What is it? It's not good news. Well, I guess that. You got tuberculosis. I'm really sorry for you, son. It's a hell of a thing. What do you mean? You're real sick. You. It's a progressive disease. You'll be... The best thing is rest. Getting somewhere... Tuberculosis. In 1899, there was not much you could do. Get somewhere dry and hot, and a syringe full of morphine, and you're on your way. Your fate sealed. Your days numbered. He didn't have a choice. He was good and he did good. When you receive the news of Arthur's condition, the game shifts without skipping a beat. The joyous exploration of the American frontier cracks and makes way for shaky uncertainty. You have it in you, I can tell. The Arthur I played all throughout the game was at most turns honorable, provided for the camp whether money or food, and took time away to help whenever he could. But the amount of hours my introspective journey through the wilderness had added up to led to an overarching air of selfishness. You don't spend hours cantering through ravines to explore the beauty of them without leaving something else behind. But when the news of Arthur's condition came to light, the game instantly switched gears. It wasn't about me and my urge for exploration anymore. As the gang was on the brink of falling apart, the world once again wanted me out. I had a goddamn plan! John. John. You are my brother. You are my son. I was coming for you. They they was talking of hanging me, Dutch. They was talking. They was talking. And now they may come and hang us all. In the last dying gasps of the gang fleeing north to escape the law, Dutch's insecurities ravage the community you've spent all game trying to keep together. It's now long past the point of no return, and as people start desperately searching for ways to get out, Arthur's place in the whole ordeal is made clear. John Marston. He had run with Dutch's gang since he was 12. Growing up alongside Arthur, the two were as close as brothers for many years. Both being raised on the Dutch's wings, getting taught how to hunt, fish, and read, they both shared a deep connection. That was before John ran off. Young Abigail had been introduced to the gang, and as she fell pregnant with John's son Jack, John disappeared. Arthur resented him, hated his ability to just turn his back on the gang, despised his apparent lack of respect for their father figure, but most of all, even after John had returned to the gang, Arthur was disappointed that he couldn't see what he had in Abigail and Jack, that both loved him. A future. I love Dutch. He saved me a long time ago. I feel like in San Denis, when I got arrested, maybe he could have done something. I feel like you should take your woman and child and get lost. Do you? You can... You could give something to Jack. It's that or... Well, I don't see no way out of this. Well, what about loyalty? Be loyal to what matters. What are you gonna do? 
Now, I'll be okay, but do it for me. It would make me feel good, if that makes any sense. A little, but listen to me. When the time comes, you gotta run and don't look back. This is over. Playing through the game, exploring every nook and cranny, I had always kept Arthur's attire to something that fit whatever I was doing. But now, at what felt like the end of the world, I decided, without really thinking, that when, after escaping the law, his hat that he'd been wearing for almost the entire game tumbled off down the river, not to replace it. A nothing decision motivated by little more than just vague feelings. And as the walls were crumbling down and Arthur's tough guy exterior started to wilt away, letting him rid himself of any connection to whom he had been, felt right. It was a decision I didn't think about, but one that felt meaningful. Not because it upped Arthur's ability or skill to do whatever, but because of all the hours I had spent together with him. My first playthrough was just north of 60 or so hours and yielded a completion percentage of about 78%. Well, this one was creeping closer to 220, but the completion, about the same. I've missed a considerable amount of content. Those 160 extra hours are, from the game's point of view, completely wasted completely unnecessary and wholly irresponsible. But without them, I might have missed out on one of the most impactful moments I've ever had in the medium. Arthur had loved Dutch like a father for decades. The man who raised him, taught him how to take care of himself and help others was losing grip on reality. His hero was fading before him, just as he himself was fading away in front of everyone else. Arthur always told people he wasn't a good man, and hearts are rarely pure, but at the same time, they are equally rarely impure. Arthur was lucky. He wasn't gone yet. He still had a chance to do something better, to make amends. Most people around the camp, his previous family members, he had at this point helped escape, but there was still one, the most important, the one who had disappointed him years before, the one who still had something to live for, John Marston. After days and weeks of struggling to find a rhythm in his new existence and come to peace with his fate, Arthur threw everything at the wall. He wasn't going to let John make the same mistake again. For all he knew, he had already left, tail between his legs or worse, but Arthur wasn't going to allow it. After running to make sure Jack was safe and on his way away from Dutch, he mustered everything he had and rescued Abigail from the clutches of the law. His last hours on Earth dedicated fully to someone else. And when he let that sink in, and without any input from me, reached into his bag and for the first time in 50 or so hours, once again put on his hat, it had weight. Many miles we The many things we learn The building of a shrine Only just to burn a tiny moment, simply predicated by an instinctive decision only made possible through deciding to sideline everything I thought was important to me, just to fully lean into a new thing, to experience something that had beckoned me to just come take a look. I saw a possibility to maybe experience something in a way I had never really had before, and as the hours slowly started to fade together, it all hinged on an instinct. I'm really sorry for you, son. It's a hell of a thing. Something so simple, something so ultimately meaningless, and yet something so tangible, like a worn, battle-scarred cowboy hat that ends up symbolizing an entire experience. A symbol of intimidation, of freedom, of belonging, being worn on every step, through every tumble, and by my side at every hardship. It was the personification of an outlaw, longing for a better life. But when the world then changed, it fell out of fashion, not by a conscious choice or willful omission, but by accident 
and apathy. I didn't feel like the same outlaw. What point was there to die as rich as possible if I was just going to die all the same? Nothing mattered. No future, no dream, no thing had a point anymore. But one man did. One man and his family. All right, Arthur, come on, let's go. You go. Keep pushing, Arthur. No. <coughs> no. I think I've pushed all I can. Come on. You go. We ain't got time for this. Not now. We ain't both gonna make it. Go. Now. I'll hold them off. It would mean a lot to me. Please. There ain't no more time for talk. Go. Arthur. Go to your family. Arthur! Get the hell out of here and be a goddamn man. You're my brother. I know. I know. And with that, for me, now 19 years later, Rockstar reaped what they set out to sell back in 2004. Red Dead Redemption 2's ending with its following epilogue leading directly into Redemption 1 feels like closing a chapter from my childhood. The once mystifying title of Red Dead Revolver had whispered of a world that young me would love, tales of outlaws, sheriffs, and the great American frontier that I daydreamed about, but for almost two decades it had remained little more than a string of words and a cover. Until now. A simple journey that in many ways wasn't doing anything that the PS2 didn't already have boatloads of, but for a group of people in the American West and players all over the world, it sparked something. An invitation from a world they desperately wanted to be a part of. So, six years later, after thousands of hours of work, that world opened up. I and the rest of the player base took our first steps in the state of New Austin and as they say, the rest is history. Red Dead Redemption was a triumph on every level, selling millions of copies, topping the score charts and remaining the talk of the town for years to come. It was the world that all of us had envisioned and while many wanted little more than to stay here forever, it had other plans. Everything around us was steeped in hostility. Every interaction, every conversation, every engagement. The world was done with outlaws. The world was done with us. So calm down and play along with us. But then, suddenly, another eight years on, a glimmer of light appeared on the horizon. A new invitation. One to the same world that had just thrown you out, and while not promising to be any different, this time, it welcomed you. The culmination of nearly 20 years of storytelling, reaping what was sown at the dawn of the new decade, characters, locations and events previously mentioned, dealt with and put aside, fully explained. Intentions understood, antagonists established, and friends forgotten. But as I sit here, after going through all of these games, some of which for a second time, I realized that while I at no point wanted to stop, this wasn't why I reinstalled Red Dead Redemption 2. No, none of it was. It was this guy. That's all I wanted to see. Just him chopping down his little trees with his little axe. And he's here in the logging camp just outside of Strawberry. And it's just as impressive as when I first saw it. But he's just a small piece in a world defined by its small pieces, all laid together like a beautiful mosaic stretching from sea to shining sea. A world that, as it started out, intrigued me, let me sample it, and then closed its doors. When it then, years later, reopened them, it had grown grown to such an extent that barely even the framework was recognizable. 
and it despised me. At every turn, it tried to throw me out and lock the door behind me, but purely through my tenacity to force myself to exist, it tolerated me, allowed me to draw breath and explore at will. Until it changed its mind. The world switched in an instant, and suddenly the question of my place within it was no longer a fight. As everything around me started to fall apart, every friendship made, every memory created, and every connection coupled, I tried to make peace with the end of the world. But I couldn't. Because the world wasn't done. It was just done with me. Last time, there was no way to fight the endless hatred. That vicious cycle of violence was going to drag you down with it, whether you went willingly or not. But this time, that glimmering light on the horizon, that one's warm welcome, they both stem from something else. Something lying far deeper. Friends. Family. Genuine people who want nothing more than to see you do well lead a happy life, and take time to reevaluate just what is important to you, to see you thrive. And that that I can make peace with. Because when the world wants you out, the least you can do is make it miss you. <laughs>